Hey, everyone, and welcome to the SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home program. I'm your moderator today. My name is Scott Nance. But before we get started, know that the SAG After Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies entirely on donations to provide emergency assistance and free educational programs to SAG After artists. This conversation is made possible thanks to the generosity of our supporters. And over the last year, the foundation has given nearly $7 million, that's right, $7 million in COVID relief to more than 7,000 performers. So if you are a sag after artist and you need help, please ask. If you can help, please give. Information can be found in the description of this video, and thank you for your support. So without further ado, it is my pleasure, it is my honor to introduce to you actor, I mean actor, legend Harvey Keitel. He's here to talk with us about his new film, Lansky, and his illustrious career. Hello, Harvey. How are you doing today? Okay, Scott, and thank you. I enjoyed that introduction, and... Um... Uh, the good work that your foundation is doing. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. So let's let's get right into it about Lansky. What was your first take on Meyer Lansky, and what was it that attracted you to this role and to this film? Uh, it's a story I actually like telling. This, uh, I live in New York and L.A., um, uh, and uh, uh, once in a while, this guy would show up in front of my building, you know, and tell me he has a script, this and that, and he showed it to me, and we talked, and then he showed up again uh, six months later, you know, a year later, what, what, whatever it was, you know, and, um, um, uh, and uh, I was told his name is Eitan Rockefeller. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When I heard Rockefeller, I saw the cash register going. <laughs> <laughs> and then after about three years of him chasing me around, I found out his name was Rockaway, not Rockefeller. <laughs> so I got a ton Rockaway version of Rockefeller. And I'm glad I did. He's a great guy and very talented writer and director. And um, uh, finally, after some uh, changes over the three years, um, I wanted to do it. Well, what were your points of connection for Meyer Lansky? Like, how did you how did you relate to this guy? How did you like really get him and understand him? Um, I didn't know at that time that there had been Nazi rallies in New York before, prior to World War II. I didn't know that Meyer Lansky had organized his men to uh, take down the Nazi fundraising events. Um, I didn't know that. Uh, uh, Maya was, a, 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 well, I knew he was a refugee, but I had known that he was from um, a ghetto, uh, a uh, shtetl, uh, whatever they would call it at that time in Poland, and that his family had migrated here. I am the child of immigrants myself, mother from Romania and father from Poland, where he's from. I didn't know that his his uncle or relative um, had had his hand uh, chopped off by uh, invading Cossacks that raided their uh, shtetl in the any time they felt like it. And that, that pushed his journey, his family's journey to uh, America to land on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, where my parents landed as well, Ellis Island, and uh, then coming to uh, Lower Manhattan. What, with all the all the acting uh, uh, performances you've done over these years, what were the unique challenges to playing Lansky? Like, what, what was what made it more of a challenge for you to play Lansky than than some of these other roles that we're going to get into? Well, particularly now because the issue of immigration is so powerful mm -hmm. in our country, uh, I was even more motivated to uh, to engage in doing Maya. Um, this little immigrant boy, I don't know how old he was, I don't remember when he came here, but he was a little boy and he met uh, Luci, um, Luciano, I was going to say, Lucky Luciano, you know, on the Lower East Side when they were both kids, like 14, 15 years old, something like that. And um, 
uh, my parents had come to the same place on the Lower East Side. Uh, my father had a push cart when he came. And uh, Maya's family was uh, escaping poverty and, and, and oppression in this country, just the same as it's happening today. And uh, as a kid, he was just such a smart young man. Uh, he was just so, uh, particularly intelligent. And I always thought, my gosh, if he had had an education coming to the country, if his parents had had an education, they didn't have to struggle to put bread on the table, so to speak. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. And um, frankly, I come from a, uh, well, I guess you'd say a lower middle class background myself. Yep. My father was a push cart when I was born and uh, difficulties putting bread on the table at times. Um, what would Maya have done with his intelligence had he had an education, the opportunity for an education? And I feel the same way today in America. I know it was the same way when I was born in Brooklyn. And it's the same way today with immigrants. And we're fighting to give them um, equal justice under our laws and in education so they can become truly part of America. Mm -hmm. The democracy, we call ourselves. Um, and uh, then when Maya grew up, I mean, he had to make a living as a, as a young man, and he got involved in a life of crime. Uh, make no mistake about it, he was a criminal, and he was uh, one of the men that formed uh, Murder Incorporated. And uh, his life went that way. And he was able to make a living that way. Yep. Um, I don't know why, but it's bringing to mind now uh, Mrs. Reagan's slogan of uh, just say no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you're in poverty, it's difficult to say just say no. It was a slogan that always bothered me because it wasn't dealing with the real problem itself. So um, then Maya grew up and raised a, a, a family. He had a son that was challenged and Spent his life, unfortunately, in the hospital, in bed. Yep. But, but Maya took care of him. He was a father first um, and a criminal. And those two elements interested me. They inspired me to examine my own self and the people I knew growing up in Brooklyn, mm. things that they did, obstacles they came across to make a buck. And some of them who, uh, who didn't make it died from overdoses and crime. And uh, others went on to great educations and survived well. And I hope we can do that today. And that's what made me uh, inspire to try to tell Maya's story. Well, it, it is definitely was a Jewish boy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that makes two of us. <laughs> that makes three of us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, Harvey, when you're when you're making a film where two actors play the same person and they're playing them at, at very, very different ages. I'm wondering if in this case you met with John Magaro, who plays Meyer as a younger man. So you can kind of like sort of cross check how you're going to play this guy, or did you deliberately not speak with John so you can keep your performances unique and separate? You just said it all. We deliberately did not speak so that they could uh. be separate. But we, we both knew Maya's background and who he was. And uh, the rest was left to Aton to put it together. Well, what you were talking about, Aton, and it's uh, it's it's definitely Rockaway, not Rockefeller. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but when, if Mr. Uh, Rockefeller is listening to us, feel free to call. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so, what make it? What made Aton a a great actor's like an actor's director? You ever hear the expression? He's a great guy. Well, Aton just has this charm and uh, goodness about him. Um, that I enjoyed and um, his connection with the immigration problem, his connection with Israel, which is where he's from and his loyalty to his people and his loyalty to the immigrant 
because he knows about it. His father is a well-respected professor in Israel who had met Maya Lansky and in, uh, interviewed him in person and wrote a book about it. So there was that connection. Um, mm -hmm. Eitan wanted to, to do the right thing about telling the story of Maya. So when you were doing uh, like, like prep and research into Meyer, were the things about Meyer that you discovered that you channeled into your performance? Well, Scott, everything I've been talking about up to this point, uh, the fact that he had the courage, the guts to, to uh, gather together a few of his men to uh, bring down this Nazi rally that was raising money for their effort at that time in America, the war was to come. And um, I can't say I didn't like that line that Maya was quoted as saying that uh, he wished he had killed them all there while they were raising money for the Nazi movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I heard, yeah. Yeah. And uh, reminds me of a quote by Bruno Bettelheim, who said, if every Jew had picked up a gun, uh, before World War II, there would have been no Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine what immigrants are thinking today about their plight and their oppression where they live. So uh, well, we're all so connected. And um, uh, Maya, uh, he didn't know it then, you know. Uh, uh, we're all so connected in our efforts to be human and to use our intelligence and our goodness in good ways, but it's not always possible. You know, Harvey, if there's one thing that I think we all learned over these last two years almost now, is that yes, we are absolutely all connected in, 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 in much bigger ways than we ever realized. But one other quote, Harvey, I wanna say uh, that I really picked up from Meyer was when he says, control the game and like, I mean, Meyer really seemed like he was always in control. That was an earned quote when Meyer says control the game. And that was definitely something that I picked up on. Yes, so did I. <laughs> <laughs> um, even when I was a boy in Brooklyn, before I knew about Meyer, controlled the game. Um, when we went to the racetrack or we uh, were playing cards, you know, for money or shooting dice, um, shooting crap as it, as it was called. Um, uh, we knew the game was controlled. Mm -hmm. We knew the, the gambling casinos were not going to go broke. The racetrack wasn't going to go broke. We knew they were going to win. And we also knew we were going to win sometimes and go broke sometimes. <laughs> yeah. um, and all those uh, nefarious enterprises, let's call them. <laughs> we, couldn't, we couldn't be successful stick-up guys. Well, uh, control the game is something that you obviously have done extremely well uh, uh, since uh, your your acting debut in the in the late '60s. But what was it, uh, Harvey, that made you want to become an actor in the first place? Well, you know, uh, growing up the way I did, and uh, um, and then, well, we were in poverty at times. Um, also, my parents were hardworking immigrants. Uh, my father had wound up working at a sewing machine his, his entire life, making parts to ladies' hats. And then my mother got involved in opening up a luncheonette with a partner, a small luncheonette, you know, in, the, in, in, in Brooklyn. And they labored very hard. And while my friends, I come from a very group of friends, from every, every layer of society, as you can imagine. And the ones who had education, prospered. The ones who didn't had it very, very difficult. Mm. And a lot of them are the, are the ones that did, in fact, go to prison and, and OD and didn't have very good lives. Uh, I, I got lucky. I got lucky. I always wanted to. Well, I got thrown out of high school <laughs> and uh, I joined the Marines at 17. And I learned a lot being a young Marine. I was there for three years about honor, about courage, about pride, and about 
a lot of the education I missed by quitting school. Mm. Sorry, I didn't quit. They, I like to say they asked me to leave, but they threw me out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to stay, but I was truant too often. And there was a law at that time that you could only be truant so many days. I had this English uh, teacher at one, at one of the schools I went to who, who, who stood up for me and asked them not to uh, throw me out. But uh, the law was stronger than he was. And I went back to my school I had come from, Abraham Lincoln High School, and they wouldn't take me back. The dean wouldn't take me back. It's a little, little funny story about that. Um, but okay, I'm getting lost in my own history now. So, so when, uh, like, the, when did you get the bug? Like, what made you get oh. the acting bug? Well, well, a- after the uh, Marine Corps, I, w- I was yearning for an education. I didn't have the money to get into schools that would take me. And I didn't have a diploma, except in high school equivalency diploma that I got in the Marine Corps by going to school at night uh, when there was a chance to do that. Um, so I became a court stenographer you know, taking down hearings. And I met this wonderful, very handsome young Greek guy when we worked for the city of New York. It's almost like a Kafka novel. And he asked me one day, Harvey, would you like to see about acting? And I was working in the criminal courts at the time. Um, I said, okay. I went with him to this place uh, on 23rd Street and 5th Avenue. Mm -hmm. And... um, so not the Fifth Avenue you're thinking of. The 23rd Street and Fifth, it was a beautifully architected, architected building, but it was a slum. Mm-hmm. We, we walked in the building, and uh, the staircase was like tilted about, I don't know how many degrees that would be, um, and walked up the stairs to the fifth floor. There was no elevator. And walked into this room, this huge uh, studio loft. And behind the desk was this man, Anthony Menino. I miss him to, to this day. He was my first acting teacher. Oh, wow. And a wonderful artistic guy. And um, he, 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 uh, he talked to us a little bit, and my friend decided to leave. And I stayed. And um, I'll make the story very short. Anthony Menino said to me, do you see that clothing rack over there that was on the side of us? Um, I said, yes. Uh, he, he said, go over there and count all the hangers. I looked at it. I looked back at him. There were a lot of hangers. I mean, maybe 50 or so. I don't know. I said, okay. I walked over, counted the hangers, came back. I said, okay. He said, did you count the hangers? I said, yeah. He said, how many are there? I said, uh, 35. He said, did you count every single one? I said, no. He said, well, go back. <laughs> Count every single one because acting is doing things truthfully mm. with a purpose. Mm-hmm. That was wow. my first acting lesson, and I never forgot it. Well, from like there, said, uh, you certainly, I'm, I'm assuming, must have learned a lot of uh, acting tools from the likes of Stella Adler and Lee Strasberg. I mean, talk about learning from, you can't get better than that, right? <laughs> Frank Cassaro and, and uh, uh, others, am I forgetting? No, Frank Cassaro and yes. There, there were some others from the actor studio that were teachers as well as actors. And it couldn't get better than that. No, no. That's where I got really lucky. Well, I got to tell you, Harvey, talk about getting really lucky. Since your, your feature film debut in 1967's Who's That Knocking on My Door? With a with 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 a young gentleman named Martin Scorsese that has produced a relationship that endures to this very day. But what was your first impression of Martin, or as as I know your friend, uh, your friends like to call him Marty Scorsese? Your first impression of him? He was this short guy with long hair down to his shoulders, like here, you know, and he was a very amiable guy. Um, I showed up for the auditions. I was still a court stenographer, um, but I'd been studying acting. Um, 
And uh, I used to look, follow show business magazine or backstage yep. to see where I could audition to learn how to act, you know, along with my lessons. And um, uh, so I, Marty had an ad in backstage or show business for a student film being made on weekends through the winter, no money. And I went down to audition. There were about 50 actors there. I, I, it scared me. I said, that many actors coming down for a non-paying job? Uh -huh. um, uh, after about three auditions, it came down to me uh, and I think two or three other guys. No more than that. Uh, so I came. That audition was at, at nighttime at NYU. I came down. Uh, I walked in. All the lights were out except the lights in the hallway and that. And Marty was there with some, some students. Of, of his that were helping him out. And uh, they gave me a seat and one came back um, and said, you see that light down the hallway, the room it's emanating from? I said, yeah. He said, well, go down to that room. It was a, a, a classroom at NYU and go into that room. He said, okay. So I get up from my seat, I'm going down the hallway, I go into the room, there's one light on. On a, on a desk, like I'm sitting in front of now with a light, you know, like that. And there's a guy sitting behind it. And I, and I, and I, and I go, I'll use you as the guy. I go, uh, hey, hey, he says, sit the fuck down. I said, huh? He said, I said, sit the fuck down. I said, excuse me, but uh, who, who are you? He said, it doesn't matter who I am. Sit the fuck down. The whole classroom was dark, pitch black, except for that light and a few chairs in front. I said, go fuck yourself. And I go toward him. He gets up from his chair, you know, comes toward me, and a voice shouts out from the back of this darkness. Harvey, no, no, stop, stop. It's an improvisation. It's an improvisation. As me and this guy are about to, you know, uh, take off with each other. <laughs> and here comes Marty running down the staircase. I go, what? He says, it's an improvisation. I said, Marty, come here. Let me give you some advice. If you're doing an improvisation with an actor, it's a good idea to tell him. <laughs> <laughs> and there's your genius. That's how I describe Scorsese's genius to everyone. Mm -hmm. Well, wow, that's a that's a great introduction. Jeez, he became um, an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but if if uh, who's not knocking on my door was like your first like collaboration, yeah, I think everyone yeah. will say uh, will certainly uh, certainly feels that 1973's Mean Streets, which not only brings you back with the uh, with Martin Scorsese, but also brings you for the first time with Robert De Niro. I know you call him Bobby. But to me, he's Robert De Niro. I so, don't call him Bobby. I call him Robert. <laughs> you call him? Okay, good. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so really. Uh, and a couple this, of other names. <laughs> <laughs> so the, some that, that, you know, probably yeah. just between the two of you. But, we'll but have a drink. Uh, Har Harvey, uh, uh, I like that movie is such a breakthrough. It's such a landmark film. It's, a, it's Scorsese's first true classic. But what was it about? that film that felt special. And certainly what was it about your relationship with Robert De Niro that also felt special and it still is to this very day after doing the Irishman. Still is to this day. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I enjoy saying, uh, telling how I met Robert. I went to the actor's studio for a, a session. We met every Tuesday and Friday, I think it was that Thursday. And, uh, uh, an actress friend of mine was standing outside with the other actors and actresses talking to a, a guy. I walked up. Uh, her name was Mary Anisi. Hi, Mary, if you're watching this, I still <laughs> love you. <laughs> um, and she said, uh, uh, Mary said, uh, Harvey, this is Robert. Or Bobby. Robert, this is Harvey. Can I tell? We both, both looked at each other, like looking at you, and went, huh? Huh. and um, we grunted at each other like that. And then it built up a little bit to a, <laughs> a, little, a little grin, you know. 
And then we started laughing a little bit, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and then we turned into a big laugh. Like <laughs> and the doors to the studio, studio opened. And we walked in. And I never spoke to him again. Till a year later, when we made Mean Streets. Mm-hmm. And uh, then we became pals. Well, you, you reteamed again. The, this one was a real doozy for 1976's Taxi Driver. And from what I understand, you were originally offered a different role than the one you wound up playing. Do you remember the role that you were offered and why you decided to change uh, to go to play sport instead? Keep that question in mind. I want to back up a bit because I think you'll enjoy to hear this. I had the role in Mean Streets three different times. Marty said he's making this movie, Mean Streets, and he wants me to play Charlie in it. Then one day he comes to me and says, uh, Harvey, uh, um, I, 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 John Voigt, I've offered John Voigt the part, you know, and, uh, and, and uh, so you're not going to play it. I said, what? Okay, a week or so passed by when he calls me. Harvey, you are going to play the part. John Voigt, and John Voigt was big enough, I must say, to say to Marty, don't use me in the role. Use an unknown actor Mm. because I'm going to set the film off balance. So he said, you got the part. I said, oh, great. Okay. Uh, So I'm down uh, in Little Italy with Marty standing on a rooftop there, talking to him about, about the movie. And he says, Harvey, um, I got to tell you, I, 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 there's somebody else I want to play the part. Uh, I'm not going to name names. Uh, I said, wow. He said, yeah, I'm sorry. So the luck of the Irish, this fellow got offered a part on Broadway instead of a non-paying movie with an unknown uh, director, you know, uh, made for about a couple hundred thousand bucks, I don't know. Um, so I was out of a job again. That was twice. Wow. But then he had to take the job. He had to take the job on Broadway. It was Broadway. Uh-huh. So he told Marty he can't do the movie. So Marty came back to me for the third time and said, okay, you can play the part. So that's how that began, and and <laughs> and then uh, and then Marty said uh, he wants uh, Robert this is actor Robert De Niro for the role, whom I had seen work at the actor studio, and I said great, there's nobody on the planet that could play uh, Johnny Boy yep. the way he will. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but Marty said he doesn't want to play it. I said what? I said let me talk to him, and I went. To talk to him, he just you know, got a guy like we hadn't been in front of the actor studio year, year year before, and he said, "Okay, he'll do it." And um, we uh, began that way, uh, and then at one point, uh, um, Robert had asked me, "Would you mind if I played your part and you played my part?" I said, "No, fine." I just wanted him in the movie. I'd seen him work at the acting studio and there was nobody like him around. Mm -hmm. Uh, But Marty nixed that. Marty knew what he was doing. He was right. Uh, No one would have played uh, Johnny Boy like, 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 like he did. Wow. And uh, that's how that all came together. So we all became uh, very close. So that, that's a, that's great. I mean, that's a great story, but how did it come for you to not play the campaign manager in taxi driver, the role that went to ultimately Albert Brooks? Yeah. Albert's uh, such a wonderful guy. He's one of the first people I met when I went to Hollywood and we used to hang around together with George Memoli. He was in um, uh, main streets, a heavy guy died too young. Um, uh, it happened because I lived in Hell's Kitchen at the time of we were doing Mean Streets in a four-story walk-up, you know, and uh, and uh, I used to pass by all the pimps on on Tenth Avenue to get to where I lived, 
which was between 10th and 11th Avenue, right across the street from the actor studio, directly across. And um, I used to see them there all the time, you know, and, uh, and they fascinated me. Uh, transvestites, pimps, and all that. And um, the line of the pimp in the taxi driver was about five lines. But I knew what I could do with the part mm -hmm. from observing these guys all the times I came back home at night from Jimmy Ray's or Joe Allen's to where I lived in Hell's Kitchen. So Marty said, uh, but it's only five lines. I said, that's okay. Let me do it. So uh, he said, okay. You know, he wanted me to play the larger part. Um, and I went and I got a pimp I met. He said it was a former pimp. I didn't question it. And, and I took him to the actor's studio, not a session, but down in one of the rehearsal rooms. And I worked with him for about two weeks. Hmm. And uh, he uh, taught me about being a pimp and about the relationship with the girl because I couldn't quite understand it. And, um, and, and the thing I couldn't understand, excuse me, was this, I'll tell you about right now. He says, part of his t teaching me was that you love the girl. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm making believe I love her. He said, no, you love her. I said, yeah, but he's, uh, she's uh, you know, a prostitute. He said, you love her. You say you're going to do something for her, you do it. You don't lie to her. And uh, there was something, I never knew how serious he was about that. Um, to this day, I'm not quite sure I played that role of the pimp well. <laughs> um, he said, you love her. And that's the way I played it. You know, you take care of her. You see that she's okay. Everything about her, anything she wants. And... Um, and uh, that, that's where I got the, the idea of uh, how to play the pin. And we wrote the part. Uh, I wrote the part. Interesting. Wow. Wow. And, uh, and they, they, the whole costume was my idea originally coming from the pimps. I saw her along 10th, 11th Avenue. What about Jodie Foster? Foster. Uh, Jodie Foster was only like 12 years old when she made Yeah, this. Yeah, well. I insisted that her mother be on the set whenever we shot. Mm -hmm. I, I, I insisted on that. And they had somebody from uh, SAG there anyway. Mm -hmm. But I insisted that her mother be there. Because that dance se sequence, you know, I wrote the song for that. Because in those days, there was that, uh, that singer. Uh, oh, uh, Barry White? Uh, Barry White. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> voice, you know. Yeah. And I sure. just... I just made up the uh, the lyrics to "Come to Me, Baby." Wow! Wow! And we, and we did that scene. It wasn't in the script. None of the lines were in the script. So uh, we, we, that, we improvised that, them all. The right. shootout scene, the final scene, where Travis goes to like rescue her. Uh, I mean that that scene is still shocking. You know, forty almost fifty years later. Uh, what do you remember about the filming of that final scene? Not much. <laughs> um, uh, Robert goes to her. Yeah, well, first he sees me in the hallway, I think, uh, right? And he shoots yep. me. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, he shoots uh, a bit. Um, well, uh, I remember there was some uh, some little conflict between the DP and me there. I don't know, but I can't remember what it, what it was exactly. I wanted to do one thing and he wanted to shoot something else a different way, something like that. Um, but uh, uh, everything turned out fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so, so the year after tax- I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. One, one, one little thing about that, because I'd like yeah. actors to know, is that uh, the costume I made up from the pimps I saw. And I wanted to have long hair. I didn't have long hair at the time. So I asked them for a wig. And uh, they said they wouldn't give me a wig. It cost too much money. So I went to Marty. 
I said, Marty, I need a wig for this part. I got to have long hair. So Marty went to the producers and said, give him whatever he wants. Okay. The record's straight now. The record has been set straight officially right here in the SAG After Foundation conversation. Okay. So the year after Taxi Driver, that brings you to working for working with another legendary director who's still vital to this day, uh, Ridley Scott, uh, The Duelists. What was uh, what was your experience like working with him uh, on his on his feature film debut? He was great. He was so much fun. Really nice guy. Again, like I say, I was lucky. And um, I wasn't going to do his movie uh, because at that time I was earning a low six figure number and um, the studio wouldn't pay it. Um, they were twenty five thousand dollars short. And um, uh, uh, during those days, we didn't sort of work with commercial directors. It was sort of something we didn't do, us actors that came from New York. Um, So my agent talked me into seeing Ridley Scott's commercial reel. Mm. I said, I'm not going to see his commercial reel. I don't want to work with any commercial directors, quote unquote. He taught me into it, really taught me into it, because I, I was adamant about it. Um, having met one commercial director for a part in his movie in Hollywood and um, at the Polo Lounge at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and it was a part I wanted to play. So it was me sitting here, my agent sitting here, the uh, commercial director sitting where you are. I can't remember his name now, but he was becoming popular now. And during the conversation, he says to me, I'm sorry, Harvey, but I just don't see you as being a sensitive guy. <laughs> and my hand went, my agent's hand went under the table onto my thigh and grabbed it. And he said, don't, don't, because I was going to tell him to go fuck himself, you know. And he didn't give me a part. Okay, now back to the chase. Where, where was I? Oh, yeah, Ridley. Um, we had a great time making that film, really did. And uh, 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 we, we, Keith Carradine was terrific. We, uh, we took fencing lessons from an Olympic fencer from, U, from USC, uh, UCLA, for, for a month. Um, I uh, had gone to the uh, museum in Paris to see the costumes, what they were like. And um, uh, because I couldn't turn my neck and the costume was so stiff. I said, how am I going to fight a duel? I mean, on horseback in the war when, 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 when I, I can't turn my neck. Uh, I said, really, I went to the museum in Paris and saw the costumes. Someone is, the customer is mistaken. They weren't stiff like that. They were either made out of cloth, layers of cloth. So uh, really had the costume remade so that I could turn my head and use my sword. Uh, um, and uh, it was a great time, really was great to work with. He's, um, oh, oh yes, it was a funny story from that. Um, really Scott's uh, commercial reel was like little movies. Mm-hmm. And I learned a lesson there. Don't be so uptight, Harvey. Don't be so Mr. Know-it-all. So, so uh, only uh, method directors and all that. Uh, they were like short movies. So I did say yes. And uh, uh, and, and Ridley had said, uh, I'll give you the extra $25,000. Mm-hmm. As I said, thank you, but I'm not going to take it. I'm going to do the movie because you want me to do it. That's the end of that part of that story. Then there's a scene in, in the, the Duelist where um, Thoreau, this was the name of the character, I think, yep. mm-hmm. was uh, preparing troops for an invasion of, uh, of uh, Paris to take back the throne. And I was General Thoreau. So really set up this beautiful scene, which is about well, twice as long as this table I'm sitting at with candles and flames and a lot of extras and all that. Which really, which really is a genius at, as you know. 
And um, uh, an emissary from the crown comes to see me, to talk to me about stopping this, stop preparing an invasion to retake the crown. So he was a colonel that they sent. I was a general. So we rehearsed the scene and he comes in and I'm standing up at, at, the, at the war chart maps and all that. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm standing. I'm not going to stand now because of the camera. And he comes in and sits on my table. So I went to Ridley. I said, Ridley, uh, could you ask him not to sit on my table? A colonel doesn't sit on a general's table. That could never happen. Um, he goes back to the actor, comes back to me and says, well, Harvey, in those days, they allowed that. I said, what do you mean in those days? Were you there? You weren't there. <laughs> I served three years in the Marine Corps. A colonel would never, ever sit on the general's desk. He goes back to the actor, comes back to me, says, Harvey, he wants to sit on that desk. Let him. I said, okay, let him. He gets, hit, get to, he gets in at his position. I get in mine, but he says, action. He comes in. Um, he says, General Faro. I turn around. He puts his ass on my desk. I said, get your ass off my desk. And he stood up like the gentleman he was, the English gentleman he was, and he didn't sit down. <laughs> and we kept it in the movie. So it really was, you know, cool to work with. That, really. That. Ridley, Ridley, Ridley Scott is one of my all-time favorite directors. So, so I moved to California, to Los Angeles in 1991, and it was here in L.A. where I saw uh, the first of, of, of a bunch of movies for you that really put you in this like incredible creative zone, starting with, again, with Ridley Scott, with 1991's Thelma and Louise which is a movie, Harvey, I have to say, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. I've seen it like 30 times or more. I just watched it again about six months ago. It holds up. It's amazing. Mm. But so like by this time though, Ridley Scott had already done Alien and Blade Runner. And he was like, he was also in the zone. So working with him on this film, which as you know, was very controversial for its day and holds up extremely well now. It's even more relevant now. But how- your, your character, Hal, is the only nice guy in this whole film. <laughs> Callie Curry wrote the script. I adored her, and I adore her still. She had studied acting at the beginning of her career, and it was a beautiful script. Um, but I'll tell you how I got the part. Please. <laughs> okay. I didn't have the part. <laughs> um, Someone I knew gave me the script to read and I saw the part and I went to Ridley um, and said, I'd like to play this part. And he said, okay, but he had come to me and there were years be be between uh, the duelist and Thelma Louise, right? How many years? Oh, that would be about 14. Okay. I hadn't seen him. Uh, and that's how I got that part. Wow. I mean, but, but I asked for it. You you asked for it. He gave it to you. See, that's a that's that's yeah. a good relationship. Well, he could have come to me. <laughs> but you know what, Harvey? The thing is, and it took many viewings for it to 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 hit me. But you don't have any on camera scenes with Susan Sarandon and Gina Davis. But it took so many viewings, but it finally hit me. So so when you finally saw the finished film yourself. Because, you know, you're doing all your scenes without them. What was it like for you to finally watch Thumb and Louise? Well, this is part of the reason, I guess, that I'm in theater. You know, I really did do scenes with them in my own mind and imagination. Mm -hmm. Their oh. story, their story was important to me. That same year. So Thumb and Louise, it becomes this uh, hot topic of conversation. It's on the cover of, I think it was a. Uh, Time or Newsweek magazine with uh, Susan and Gina. It says why Thumb Louise uh, strikes a nerve. And it 
it's still relevant to this day. It still holds up. It's so provocative, even by today's standards. But also that same year, you made the film Bugsy, uh, which gave you your first Oscar nomination. And like, and it's just kind of funny because now here you are coming full circle, uh, sort of with the same subject matter in Lansky. But but what was it about the character of Mickey Cohen that you just said, I got this guy? Frankly, in all those years that passed, during all those years that, that passed, you know, my, my own feelings about myself being an actor, being a person on the planet, have gone through transformations. And um, what I felt playing Lansky went a lot deeper in my own cognition than at the time, how many years before that I played? Um, Bugsy, yeah, 1991. Bugsy, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. It, um, because I had done, by the way, he didn't like being called Bugsy. He was called Ben. Yeah. No one called him Bugsy. <laughs> I'll tell you a story about, about that. Um, I played Ben Siegel to, um, uh, what's her name? Virginia Hill, the Virginia Hill story. So I played uh, Ben Siegel. I was t- get, getting a manicure at a barbershop here in Beverly Hills. Um, because, you know, uh, Ben was a very dapper guy and very handsome guy and all that. And I'm sitting in Barber's chair. It was a men's shop only. And there were like two, two of the barbers there and my, mine. And my barber says to me, Harvey, the fellow sitting next to you in the chair was, was Ben's attorney. I said, what? He says, yeah. He says, would you like to meet him? I said, sure, absolutely. So I'm sitting in the chair. I got the thing around me, you know. And uh, he was sitting to my right, I think. And he says, uh, I forget the the attorney's name now. This is Harvey Keitel. He's going to be playing Ben in a new movie. And he looks at me and he says, one line. You're not as good looking as Ben was. And he turned away from me. And he wouldn't speak to me again. That was it. Okay, so so um, what was it about Bugsy? What was it about about Mickey Cohen? That I mean, you you just it was an Oscar nominated performance. Like, what was it about him that just made you go? I, I yeah. understand him. You know, working with uh uh you know uh, you well know, maybe when when Jim Tobacco who wrote a terrific sc- screenplay told me you're going to get a nomination for this movie. I said, Are you kidding me? You're crazy. He said, Harvey, you will, you will. I said, Jim, I've done better scenes in acting class. You know, the, the part was small. And sure enough, I get a nomination. You know, I said, well, that's part of the thing about Hollywood. You know, I'm in a Hollywood film. Um, uh, uh, Lansky, for instance, is a $5 million film. Films people get nominated for today are 50, 75, $100 million films. Sure. Um, so uh, uh, about about Mickey Cohn, I didn't have I wasn't the same person emotionally that I was when I took the part of Meyer, Lansky and Lansky. Um, so it's a whole different uh, feeling about it. Um, all my colleagues watching have been in the same positions, plural, that I've been in. And I have been there with you too. So you know what I'm talk, talking about. Um, uh, Warren Beatty, who's a wonderful actor and cares a great deal about his craft, you know, about what he does, comes into my trailer one day and he says, I know Harvey, you should be playing Ben. I know. And I said, no, Warren, you earned it. So you should be playing Ben. I say that just for the sake of my fellow actors who uh, understand we are caught up in, in a duality that has a great deal of conflict uh, historically. The Greeks first discovered it in our birth, but um, we're always at war with things inside of ourselves. Um, and it's a battle that we always fight. All these actors and actresses watching this and uh, myself and still. So anyway, that was a little throwaway story. 
That's a good story. Man, there's no yeah, well, well, far away well, story. Well, well, Warren, I admired Warren, Warren for saying that. You know, it took it took a it took a giving heart to uh, say that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, that was a selfless comment for sure. So, okay. but the director wouldn't change parts. <laughs> <laughs> Barry Levinson. Yep. Nope. He <laughs> stuck to his guns. I'm kidding Let- about that. <laughs> well, listen. I mean, you talk about battle and fights. The following year, 1992. Again, working with another director, making his directorial debut. And this is a director who has changed the game in a lot of ways and is absolutely still vital to this day and age. Quentin Tarantino, Reservoir Dogs. Wow. When I saw this movie for the first time, Harvey, like I've, I just knocked my socks off. Uh, and you actually, from what I understand, you helped Quentin get this movie made. How did you do that? <laughs> I asked God's permission. <laughs> um, well, a colleague of mine, a woman from the actor studio, called me one day to say, I have a screenplay I think you're going to like. You really like to uh, move the playing field from like. And uh, I called uh, Lawrence Bender, who produced the movie, said who I was, and then called Quentin, who said I wasn't Harvey Keitel. <laughs> I said, no, I am. <laughs> uh, and me and Quentin got together. And uh, it, was, it was very funny because it knocked on my door. I was doing a film in California at the time. And uh, the door opens and then, and then there's this big guy, you know, hulking guy. And he says, Mr. Keitel? I said, it's Keitel, but come in. <laughs> <laughs> so he came in. We had a conversation. And I asked him um, during the conversation, is there anybody in your family that's uh, connected in any way? He said, no. I said, uh, well, does your family, any members of your family connected to other members of uh, some, or- you know, some organization? He said, no. I said, no uncle or brother or cousin? He said, no. I said, what about you? The guys you hung around with, were they tough guys, you know, neighborhood guys? He said, no. I said, well, how the hell did you write this screenplay? He said, I watched movies. Wow. Wow. Yep. I said, well, okay. (laughs) And then um, and then uh, they didn't want him to direct the movie. And they asked me not to encourage him to direct it. They wanted Monty Hellman to direct it. Monty Hellman was a gentleman. And um he wanted Quentin to direct it also because I told him I wouldn't do it unless Quentin directed it. Um, so Monty supported me in that. And uh, they allowed Quentin to direct it. And then Quentin wanted to play a part in the movie. Yeah. And the producers came <laughs> uh, to me privately. Forgive me, producers, but, you know, let's tell a Hollywood story. To ask me not to Encourage him to play the part he played in the movie. I said, I'm sorry, but I want him to play a larger part. And they said, no, Harvey, no, no, no. He's never done a film in his life. I said, yes, he has. They said, where? What film? I said, it's written on the page. And so they agreed to let him play the part he played. And and, uh, life went on forever after. That was one bloody movie, I have to say. <laughs> it was. It was. It, 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 it was just, uh, you know, I had the same feeling, only about another script I read, uh, Jane Campion's... Uh, the Piano? The, the Piano. That, that struck my whole body that way when I re- read it, you know. Uh, it just moved me so much, uh, Reservoir Dogs, and... I saw Quentin's talent on the page. I felt it on the page like I did James. Wow. Amazing. I mean, that film and that, and that same year, uh, Harvey. So not only do you have Reservoir Dogs, but you also have Bad Lieutenant, which is a film. What a performance that you gave in that movie. So deep, so dark, so vulnerable. Uh, like how did you approach playing this guy because that is just still to this day, you watch bad Lieutenant. It is a really gritty film and a mind blowing performance. One of your very best. 
Well, first, thank you, Scott, for the introduction to that. I don't know how I did it. I, I wanted to do it because it touched me again. Uh, Abel and uh, he had a couple of daughters. I had a daughter. They slept together at times and uh, played with each other. And uh, and a woman wrote the script first, the, the original script. She wrote a part of it. Her name was Zoe. She plays the woman in the film that shoots me up uh, with the heroin dose. It was a saline solution, and it was a nurse present. Mm -hmm. And actors shouldn't think they could go ahead and shoot themselves up. Yeah. Um, that would be dangerous. Um, so we did have, a, I insisted a nurse be present. It was just, it was like a love story. Um, what's running through my mind now is, is that it was like the piano. Um, what this man was going through in his life, but except that he was twisted in a way that he couldn't, he couldn't work his way out of the cyclone he was caught up in, um, <clears throat> and he paid the price for it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He sure um, did. It kind of ended the way it had to end. I mean. Yeah. 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 And we uh, uh, we improvised a lot of that script. Uh, well, what happened, again, for my fellow actors, I was in Hollywood at the time and I was I was like depressed because I couldn't get a lead in a movie. I was getting supporting roles, but I wanted a goddamn lead. And my attorney who represented Abel Ferrer at the time calls me up and says, I have a lead for you. And it's the bad lieutenant. Bad lieutenant, yeah. <laughs> so she sends me the script. The script is like that thick. I said, what the hell is this? I opened the page. The letters of the sentences are that large. What's going on here? I had about, I don't know, 15 pages to it. Something like that. I turned the page. Again, letters are that large. I take it, I throw it in the garbage can. In the garbage can. I mean, it, it like, was no script. I said, damn it, I'll never, I, I'm never going to get a lead in a movie. I better look at this more closely. I take it out of the garbage can mm -hmm. by myself at the Chateau Marmont Hotel. And I keep turning the pages and I come to the part of the nun. The part of the nun was written like it was one of the best writers you ever met in your life. Wrote that part so magnificently that I understood the bad lieutenant. And I agreed to do the film and Abel was all for me improvising. And uh, that's how we made the movie. That movie just like so, so powerful. Again, uh, you, I mean, what a, what a period of time, 91, 92 for you. And then, and then coming back with Tarantino this time in a smaller role as the wolf who likes to drive really fucking fast in <laughs> Pulp fiction. I mean, Pulp fiction is another film. Just like I remember vividly exactly where I was when I saw it. And it's a film that, I mean, it won the, the Palm d'Or at the Cannes that year in 1994. Uh, so, mm. so what was your observation about Tarantino from 1992 to 1994? Just the, 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 the confidence that he gained from working with you in Reservoir Dogs to just the bold, brave filmmaking he was doing in Pulp Fiction. Well, but when I met Quentin, I felt like, I, like he was a new old friend. Uh -huh. I just uh, channeled into him and him into me, I believe. Um, and uh, he and Lawrence Bender, uh, at the time I was going through some uh, personal problems and I wasn't going to be able to make the shooting of the movie. And I, and, and I told him, go ahead and find another actor because I don't know when the I was in a, involved in a court case, no, no crime, no, no criminal case or anything. The only way they could shoot me would be on a weekend, Saturday or Sunday it was. And of course, a fortune to shoot on the weekends, as you probably know. And Quentin and Lawrence Bender said they would not hire another actor. They would shoot me on the weekend and absorb the costs in whatever way they did it. And that's how I got to play that part. Wow. Wow. Amazing. If they hadn't stood by my side, I wouldn't be in the movie. I didn't want to hold them up because I didn't know when I'd be available. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, the next year, Harvey, you worked with another amazing filmmaker, still vital today, Spike Lee, Clockers. So this film 
was, I believe, the first film that Spike Lee directed that he didn't write the screenplay for, but it is still very much a Spike Lee movie. What was your, mm. what did you, what made him a great actor's director? What made him different from Tarantino, Ridley Scott, Martin Scorsese? Well, because Spike and I have the same battle cry. Which Brooklyn is? is in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, this guy, this Mike is such a talented guy, and his heart is in Brooklyn. And um, you can see it in his work. Um, and the book was a fantastic book. You know, I had grown up in Coney Island, Brighton Beach, went to school there, um, had friends from there, spent three years in the Marines with uh, all different types of religions and ethnic groups. And uh, the story of the young man uh, really moved me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Spike as a person, being a fellow Brooklynite, how could I say uh, no? Brooklyn and ass. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, with all, all the dramas, all the dramas that you've done, Harvey, especially after doing such a heavy role like Bad Lieutenant, so how was it for you to be able to do comedy like Sister Act mm. and Little Fockers? I mean, like, I love you're comedy. really funny. <laughs> Are you kidding? If you saw the clowns I grew up with in Brooklyn, <laughs> you wouldn't be asking this question. <laughs> I mean, comedy, I love comedy. And uh, speaking of comedy, De Niro is one of the funniest guys on the planet. Yeah, he is. <laughs> yeah. I'd so like to do more comedy. Robert Altman said to me when we made uh, Buffalo Bill and the Indians, he used to say to me, you must do comedy. I said, I said, well, nobody wants to give me a comedy. I'd love to do comedy until that picture came along, whatever it was. But you're also, you were also around this time, I would say in the like late nineties, uh, starting to do more, more action films, like from dusk till dawn. And then in 2000, U two U five, seven, one. I mean, you're like, you're, you're like doing it all. <laughs> okay. Dusk till dawn. Uh, Robert Rodriguez and Quentin yep. Tarantino did the script. Yep. Mm -hmm. I read the script and I said to myself, what the hell is this? <laughs> I don't understand anything about this, but it's Robert Rodriguez and Quentin Tarantino. I got to see what the hell they're up to. They must be up to something I don't know. And I made the movie. <laughs> and George Clooney was in it, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and I found that they were up to something, which I still don't know. <laughs> it's such a wild movie because it starts <laughs> off as one film and then it turns into this literally batshit crazy movie. <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. Well, it's I see you feel the same way I do about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, just just moving along. I mean, you know, then like getting to work with a with another visionary director like Wes Anderson in the Grand Budapest Hotel again. That like nobody you've ever worked with before, like no other film you've ever made before. Uh, you know, how is it like like at that point in your career, you're still working with directors who are different, who are still challenging you as an actor? You know, I often like to describe it um, as if you walked into a party as a young man, there were all these girls or guys there, but you see this one girl and you must know her. West is one of those guys. Yeah. What made him different? He's so angelic, the guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so decent and so talented. Uh, matter of fact, he had offered me a movie way back early in his career, which I had to turn down because I was doing another movie at the time. Um, I forget the name of it. Maybe it was his first movie or his second movie. But he's just uh, such a... So I'll be around he and his wife and their new daughter, who bears the name of one of my first girlfriends I ever had in my life in Brooklyn when I was about 12, 13 years old, wow. Freya. So, okay. So after 1973, Mean Streets, it's you, Martin Scorsese, Robert De Niro. And then in 2019, you're back with the Irishman, working with these guys again after... Again, almost 50 years. What was that? I mean, what was that like to reteam with these? Too long. Too long. <laughs> yeah, definitely too long. <laughs> um, I mean, they're Marty and Robert. Uh, 
now. They're, uh, they don't come along very often. No, for <clears throat> sure, for sure. And, uh, and our work as, as artists, I'll use that word, who, who try to tap into this aesthetic force. And I'm using that word because I stole it from Frederick Douglass, um, reading a book about him. And it's such an important force that we, are, that we pursue, all of us, you, uh, all artists pursue it. And, and, and it's such a worthy thing to keep in mind um, because it's so valuable and it's the only thing in my mind that can move us forward as a people and get us together is to tap into that aesthetic force, um, which uh, Frederick Douglass spoke about and people like uh, well, some of the Greek philosophers have as well. So anyway, Marty gives me, asked me to be in the, the Irishman. And uh, I said, Marty, I don't know if I want to, you know, and our careers together this, this way. I'd rather just leave it be the way it is. You know, I'm proud of it and, and all the work we've done. And I, I don't want to go out this way, given our career. I read the script. I mean, I went home, I took it home, and I, and I labored over it, you know. And then um, I, uh, I decided I'd rather err on the side of doing the movie than staying home and, you know, putting my head in the toilet and then flushing it. <laughs> uh, so I said, okay, I'm going to do the movie. He said, okay, great. So I come back to rehearse with him. He hands me a new script. He says, here's the new, cha the new changes. I read it. It was only a couple of pages. I said, Marty, I can't do this. The script you gave me, I could do something with it. And that's why I'm saying yes, but give this part to somebody else then because I can't do something with this rewrite. And Marty, without blinking, said, okay, then we'll use the one that you read. And that's the one that you saw. Oh, wow. That's great. I'm just saying that because of the close relationship. He trusted my instincts about it because he had enough on his hands doing the whole movie. I just had this one little part to think about it. And, and, and it was really brilliantly written, the scene. And, and the writing of it has forced me into it. And Marty saying, yes, you know, uh, I couldn't leave his side. Well, with all the films that we have, we have talked about, are there, are there a couple that we didn't talk about that you really, really cherish, that you really love, that are among your favorite movies that you have made? I'm really proud of, uh, of what this uh, director, writer, Václav Mahul, he's a Czech director, did with uh, The Painted Bird. Oh, great. That's a great movie. Uh, it had great reviews all, all over Europe. I wish I had those reviews. I mean, for the movie, I, I, I have a small part in it. And um, I wish we'd get a better release here in the States. He made it during the pandemic, so uh, I don't know quite what happened to it exactly, but I wish it would get a better, a better release. Um, any other movies? Uh, uh, well, I'll say it. Uh, Lansky uh, is is in the gangster genre, and I don't like that connotation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like it to be seen the way any film in that genre would be seen, as a story about people, and to look at the people themselves. And we've already gone into that about the immigration issue and how Maya came to America and all that. And so. Um, I wish they had more money. It was a low budget film, like around $5 million. And they didn't have the money for the kind of advertisements that would compete with these giant films. You know, we have some performances in there and uh, uh, including the directors. Uh, but uh, with a, a little more money, we could have done maybe a job that would be stronger in this race, you know, in, in Hollywood. Because Hollywood is a business. And it's an important business. And I would hope that we added to it with um, the story of Maya Lansky and how he led his life, tried to do the right thing with his family um, and paid a heavy price 
himself. And so in parting, you know, our business has definitely taken a big hit over the last couple of years with the, obviously with the pandemic and everything. So I'm just wondering if you have any, any advice from someone who has, has followed by the rule of controlling the game. Uh, what advice you have for the actors who are watching, who have been struggling during these times and with their, with their professions? I admire all of you. I come from the same place you come from, the exact same place. And a lot of us, including myself, have paid the price of that journey. I say stick with it. Stick with it. Because the only change, and I have to use Aristotle again, again um, argumentation is not enough to make a man good. It'll happen through this aesthetic force that you all possess, along with, you know, may I end it on this question. At the Cannes Film Festival for, for the piano, at one of the round tables, um, uh, one of the journalists said to me, how does it feel to play a leading man in a movie for the first time in your career? And I looked him in the eye, and these are journalists from like the New York Times, the Washington Times, and all those great magazines and all that. I said, it's not the first time. And they all looked at each other, one to the other. And he said to me, where did you do it before? I said, in my acting class. Hmm. So I urge you to stick with your work. And all I can do is embrace you all and wish you the best of luck. Well, we wish the same for you, Harvey Keitel. Thank you so much for joining us here for the SAG Actor Foundation conversation, career conversation. Again, Lansky is out now. Check it out. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Harvey Keitel. Thank, thank you. We need your work, my fellow actresses and actors. We need your work. Make no mistake about it. <laughs>